Good morning, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project and Magnetic Reversal News, bringing you a Grand Solar Minimum update Wednesday, December 4th, at noon, Mountain Time, 2019. The big story is a new series of storms moving into the West, which is going to bring heavy mountain snow, followed by mid-December uh, <laughs> revisit on the Northeast. The KP zero day is over, but December in the lower 48 begins with the most snow cover in years. 46.2% of the lower 48 covered by snow. As compared to 41.5% last year at this time. Now look at the average here. We have two of the largest snow cover years consecutively. Just as predicted. And it's good to see the Weather Channel actually putting this data out, but the mainstream did not pick up on this. Did you hear about the record snow cover? Snow cover across the lower 48 on December 2nd was the most expansive since 2003. Not only that, this does not include the latest New England storm, which just ended yesterday. And you can see here from the total snow mass for the Northern Hemisphere, excluding the mountains, that for the entire time of record keeping this season, we've been well above the multi-decadal average that dates back to 1982. And we're still two weeks ahead of schedule. And in this case, three and a half, 350 gigatons above normal, almost 33% above normal snowpack. Winter storm leaves tens of thousands without power in New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. Boston schools closed. We announced that yesterday. Governor Cuomo declared a state of emergency in seven New York counties. Boston schools were closed yesterday, and tens of thousands of customers lost electricity. Hundreds of flights canceled. Seven deaths have now been blamed on the storm. As we wait for the actual winter to come, 27,000 people in New Jersey still without power. How you doing out there, Carol? I hope you have some juice, but you have backup. We have some great footage coming out from CBS this morning of the storm. So sit back, do a dab, and enjoy. A lot of people are crying uncle this morning, so how are the conditions there? <laughs> Yeah, I'm crying uncle along with them, to be completely honest with you, but uh, it's actually still snowing here in Keene, and there is at least a foot on the ground, maybe a little bit more. But as you can see, the lights are on here, whereas through much of the Northeast, about 80,000 people are without power. Now, some folks are starting to dig out, but others, believe it or not, remain in the path of this powerful storm. This snow came in hard and furious. We were just freezing. People coast to coast are enduring the wrath of a relentless storm finally on its way out. It's really bad. Everyone should just really be careful. But not before slamming the country with more heavy snow. It's raining, then it's snowing. It's raining, then it's snowing. Rain. If we didn't have a wood stove, we wouldn't survive. Uh, there's no heat here. Power outages and bitter cold. First responders and plow trucks are working around the clock to clear accidents and roads. And we're deploying our assets uh, as uh, we can best determine by those forecasts. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo declared a state of emergency in several counties. It's a bus. Interstate 90 in New Lebanon was shut down after a bus carrying about 30 people collided with a tractor trailer. No one was seriously injured. It was one of more than 700 crashes reported in New York. We'll track the trail is off the side of the road. In New Hampshire, the Manchester Fire Department's Mike Gamash took us along to some of the about 100 storm calls he responded to Monday. I look at most of the buildings when I go by and you know, make sure nobody's stranded or there's no trees down on, on wires. Up to two feet of snow is expected on the ground in some New England areas. I was supposed to go to work today. Hi, boss. But some people, like Colleen Bannister, say they will be ready. Number one, we're smart enough to stay off the roads when it's bad. Number two, we're usually pretty good about cleaning it up. But number three is I like that our neighbors help each other out. It started snowing here in New Hampshire about 3 p.m. Sunday. Now it's due to stop here in the next few hours, but around Boston along the coast, they could get another half foot of snow. 
There you have it. Right from the mainstream itself. Powerful storm now to slam the west coast with feet of snow after that's over. Now we've just entered meteorological winter, which no one in the U.S. has ever heard of until recently. And I did a survey with people my age, and, and we all know that winter is December 21st on the solstice. But this is a new thing. This is to change your thinking into thinking that winter starts three weeks early because they're well aware of what's happening and they still want to keep up this global warming narrative. Now, once winter hits and we have record blizzards and people getting stuck in the Midwest and, and all-time storms again and again and again, at some point, hopefully, we'll hear that noise. Powerful storm to slam West Coast with feet of snow. Up to 50 inches storm max trademark. Expected. Let me just adjust that. There we go. There I am. After one storm system wallops Southern California and Arizona, it's happening right now. We're going to get to the models. With heavy rain and high country snow through Wednesday night, a much larger storm is set to slam Central and Northern California with a wide array of impacts on Friday into Saturday, as we predicted about four days ago on this channel. Although the center of the storm system will move ashore in Oregon later Saturday into Sunday night, or Saturday into Saturday night, the worst of the impacts will occur further south. Heavy rain and gusty winds will target coastal areas from San Francisco northward into southern Oregon spanning Friday into Saturday, as well as the Central Valley's I-5 corridor from Sacramento to Redding, which we just talked about in a Cascadia video we put up last night. The foothills of the Sierra Nevada will also be hard hit with flooding downpours during this time. A general 1 to 2 inches of rain is forecast for the lowest elevations of the I-5 corridor and San Francisco Bay Area, why 2 to 4 inches more likely in coastal areas of Northern California. It is in the coastal ranges and the foothills of the Sierra, however, that rainfall totals of three to six inches will occur. That is devastating flash flooding, mudslides, and that's amazing. Eight inches of, eight inches is anticipated in these regions of, of rainfall because California is no longer suffering from drought it has actually been abnormally wet over the past one to two weeks. The heavy rainfalls will significantly heighten the risk for flooding, mudslides, especially in burn scar areas from this year's wildfires. Significant travel de delays and road closures also likely, especially in areas where the stream and river flooding occurs, where mudslides cover roadways or cause collapse. Spanning Friday to Saturday night, AccuWeather meteorologists, at least one to two feet of snow will bury I-80's Donner Pass with two to four feet in the higher elevations. Storm impacts Friday to Sunday in almost half of California. Flood risks, mudslides, road closures, windy north coast. Storm max 8 inches of rain in northern California in some regions with up to 50 inches of snow up high. That is a major winter storm in meteorological winter or fall, however you want to look at it. Heavy rain and possible flooding across southern California. A moist system. Just like bunt cake. Shut up, Al. <laughs> a moist system lifting into California will produce heavy rainfall across Southern California. Heavy snow from the Southern Sierra to the Four Corners terrain today. We're on under winter storm warning or watch. I don't know. It's the yellow one. The rain may result in urban flooding around LA and San Diego, while debris flows will be possible near vulnerable burn scars. So heads up, burn scar people. There's the storm. The first punch hovering right now over the South Sierras, and that will move through tonight, and then it will be Friday in the evening, Saturday morning, when that system moves into Northern California and brings that heavy snow and heavy rain, up to eight inches of rain predicted. We showed you those precipitation maps yesterday, and now the snow totals. It's looking pretty glorious. This only goes out through December 10th. Which is 10 or 12, which is 10 days from now. Eight days. This is a week out. And you can see heavy snow moving back into the east here, especially uh, up in Ontario and eastern Canada. Again, here, Top Knot's boyhood home here in Michigan is going to be buried. And he's right down here in Goebbels. So he's looking at 16 or maybe 8 to 10 with 16 up north of him. This is through December 12th. 
Heavy snows throughout the entire Rockies, Sierras, the entire west of the Divide region, all the way down to southern New Mexico and some little touches in Arizona. Again, all the links to all the models we use are below the video in the description box. Have you heard about the coldest summer day on record in Australia? The coldest summer day just broken. Australia's lowest summer daily max temperature record was broken this week. Now, the lowest temperature measured during the opening days of December was minus four in Tasmania's Mount Wellington. But that's not the area. We're talking about the more impressive Threadbow Top Station. During the 24 hours at 9 a.m. Tuesday, it was only minus one degree, which was Australia's lowest summer daily maximum temperature ever, beating the 0.8 back in 2006, which is another solar minimum, by the way. Seismic update. No quakes of note as I was looking through the map. I saw some interesting activity out here in Turkmenistan up into the 4.6 range. And I was like, oh, God, that's got to be fracking. I did a quick research on the region and found this paper coming out in 2018, which is talking about the dragon oil complex in Turkmenistan. And that means oil and gas reserves. And when I took a look at the map where the earthquake occurred, sure enough, there are oil and gas reservoirs right at the spot, which means those are frat quakes, very big ones. That's what that means. Now, do you know about the 4,000-mile-long volcano? Have you ever heard of such a thing? Little Geology 101 right here. They're called mid-ocean ridges. These are divergent plate boundaries, which we call mid-ocean ridges. Now, I want you to picture a volcano 4,000 miles long at the bottom of the ocean. And come over to Science Daily. We're going to link this paper below, Mid-Ocean Ridges, and bone up on your Geology 101. A mid-ocean ridge or mid-oceanic ridge is an underwater mountain range formed by divergent plate boundaries bringing up hot magma from the lower portions of that plate right at the mantle boundary, the transition zone. And we have seismic activity occurring on these mid-ocean ridges as well as volcanism worldwide. Most volcanic activity is along these plate boundaries underwater, and we don't know about it. One of the most famous regions called the Axial Seamount is right off the coast of Oregon, 300 miles. And a lot of people use this to fearmonger about Yellowstone or other nonsense, as if it has something to do with the San Andreas or anything else but the divergent plate boundary, and it probably doesn't. But the Axial Seamount is a gigantic uh, shield volcano, let's say, at the mid-ocean ridge that is expelling spillite, which is a, a form of subaqueous uh, basalt. Spillite is when basalt is erupted in the subsurface, underwater. Now, this Axial Seamount um, can be seen from thermal imaging, uh, can re result in warm surface waters and changing the temperature of the water but more importantly it's predictable in its eruption so here's the uh location of the axial seamount it's in one of these transverse fault zones of the juan de fuca mid-ocean ridge here here's the plate pacific and the juan de fuca it's right here on this transverse cut basically at the washington oregon state line go out 300 miles and a little north it's far from the world's largest volcano, but the walls of the horseshoe-shaped cauldron at Axial's Peak are as high as the pillars of the Golden Gate Bridge. The volcano's main magma reservoir is two-thirds the length of Manhattan, the same width and taller than any building in the city. Axial is also, volcanologically speaking, no shrinking violet. Hmm. Over geologic time, the stationary mantle plume below the shifting Pacific tectonic plate has created an 1,120-mile-long sub line of submarine volcanoes known as the cobb eichberg Seamount Chain. Say that three times fast. Axial, the youngest member of the chain, is currently sitting atop the hot spot and is the big boomer. Now, the volcano also sits astride the mid-ocean ridge separating the Pacific plate in the west and the Juan de Fuca plate to the east. These plates are moving apart. Ridges like this are the birthplace of oceanic crust, while molten rock rises from deep within the earth to the seafloor, creating profuse volcanic activity. And if we can just get to some data here. Oh, this is on mid-ocean ridges. That's why there's no data. <laughs> 
here we can see that the uh, geologic evidence, now this is one of the most studied seamounts in the world. There's been millions of dollars pumped into this. In fact, it's an underwater volcano lab, the entire region. And the Axial Seamount is the most active submarine volcano in the Northeast Pacific, with known eruptions in 1998, 2011, 2015. It was chosen as the site of the world's first underwater volcano observatory called NEMO, and is now a node at the OOI cabled array. Here, we describe our attempts to forecast the timing of eruptions at Axial Seamount. Based on repeated patterns of ground deformation, and the work was funded by the National Science Foundation and NOAA. And you can see here the inflation threshold as the seafloor rises and then it erupted. And then it drops down here several meters. And then the magma fills again here. It had to come up about 20% more than the last time. And then it erupted in 2015 and drained to a, a not as low a level. So the suggestion now is that it will erupt again another 20% higher than the previous which is sometime in 2022. And you can come check out the new forecast plots on your own. I'll leave you links below. It's pretty awesome science, and it's a very matter-of-fact and common-sense way of predicting volcanoes. The problem is that the most deadly volcanoes are not getting this much attention, and that's why I wanted to bring this to your attention. We're barely listening to the U.S. most dangerous volcanoes. A thicket of red tape and regulation <laughs> Whoever heard of that have made it difficult for volcanologists to build monitoring stations on the most dangerous volcanoes in the U.S., including Mount Hood, Mount Rainier, and St. Helens. And this is ridiculous. If the government or your local government cared about you, this would be top priority, especially what with what we know. These volcanoes have gone off in the past. Over eight volcanoes in the West Coast erupting just in 1800. And we know it's going to happen again. Why they're not monitoring these stations? Anybody's guess. Could be Agenda 2030. Who knew? Huge lakes abruptly empty into the Greenland ice sheet. This is breaking news to scare the sh out of you. Draining meltwater could lubricate the base of the ice, speeding its flow and hastening sea level rise. Oh my God. And then you read the article and it says, Last summer... Uh, scientists saw lakes draining into the ice. Well, I guess those scientists didn't look at the surface mass budget of Greenland and realize that in the last four days, 100 gigatons of ice have built. That would be a lot of draining lakes in order to get rid of that type of volume. And they are so disingenuous on their information. Since mid-November, the upper level of the Greenland Surface mass budget has been in record gain. Record. 18 gigatons in the last 72 hours. Put that in your front yard and melt it. Now, they're rebranding climate change again to global meltdown or, or flaming earth or whatever the crap they want to say. But Cap Allen did a great piece here on the global meltdown and the rebranding of climate change. The reason it's great is because our video is linked below. And if you haven't seen the video we put out on the rebranding of climate change, I implore you to come check it out. It will be at the bottom of this article. Just click on the video and watch commercial free. Did you know that you can watch all our videos commercial free on Steemit or Patreon? You don't have to watch one commercial if you don't want to support the channel. You can do it. So don't bitch about it. Be about it. Change your ways. We may finally understand how life survived the icy hell of snowball earth. Life has faced many challenges that is, as it has scrambled over this blue marble many times. Many mass extinctions, many cosmic catastrophes. In fact, periodic and episodic, about the 12,000 year mark, with a 65 million year major boom recurring. Now these are all controlled by probably current sheets in our Milky Way. And it's simply us moving through different electrical potentials in space, causing different reactions to gas giants in our region, including our star, maybe Saturn, maybe even Uranus and Neptune react. It's anyone's guess, but we're gonna still soon see in our lifetime what happens as this unfolds. 
But let's get back to Snowball Earth. This was a time that lasted from 720 million to 635 million years ago when Earth was completely frozen for the most part. And how life got through here is anyone's guess. But shortly thereafter was the Cambrian explosion. And wow, Wixwaxia. This thing with 10 sets of legs and 12 sets of eyes. I mean, hallucinogenia. And on and on. But I digress. What they've determined here is that the transition zone below the ice where the ice is melting is a very highly oxygenated environment where life can hang on. And what that means is that some of the moons in our own solar system may hold life beneath the ice based on the information from this data. So come check it out. It's a great read for the layman. And you just might get something out of it. Dogs perceive and spontaneously normalize Formant-related speaker and vowel differences in human speech sounds. Do you know what this means? That dogs know exactly what you're saying. And Leah even has said to me, I think that Gremlin knows exactly what we're saying because the way she tilts her head and listens to every word. Well, a paper coming out today proves this fact. Domesticated animals have been shown to recognize basic phonemic information from human speech sounds and to recognize familiar speakers from their voices. My dog knows my voice over anyone else's. And I just have to say, Texas is the nexus of the Schmexes. She knows. She knows. Boom. Where are we going with this? Yeah, I wanted to finish up with Ash Gord. Now, Oppenheimer Ranch Manager Alien Allen brought this to my attention yesterday. He said, Diamond, are we going to be growing any ash gourd? And I was like, what the f is ash gourd? I never heard of it. Is it bitter melon with a different name or is it something I've never heard of? And it's something I never heard of. It's amazing. Ash gourd or winter melon. And the reason I've never heard of it is tropical. It's super tropical. It grows in very unique super tropical regions. Probably has a long growing season. I didn't get to all the details on it. I just found this amazing article on the health benefits of it. And after I read the article, I said, I need to grow this. It's almost flavorless. But mythologically speaking, this is something, this is the food of the gods. It helps your soul and many other things. And this is based on historical information and facts. So if you want to know more about ash gourd, which is also called white gourd, winter melon, wax gourd, kushmanda, turobat, kohala, nirposanika, kumbalanga, budaya gumadakaya, kumara, or komora. Come read the article. Um, and we'll be growing it in our earth tube heated geothermal greenhouse starting in the spring. I actually found... They do sell seeds on Amazon. They get very low ratings. So I went out and found a better source here for you guys if you want to grab some and you live in a warm area and you want to get these in the ground soon or even if you have a greenhouse. 30-pack of ash gourd seeds. I have no idea who this seller is. They get 100% positive, but it's four fifty, dollars And it's coming all the way from India where these grow. So I recommend you buy directly from the source. Wait a little bit. But it says here you'll get them right away. Just less than two weeks maybe. So 450 for a 30 seed pack. If you guys grow these this year, please send me your stories because I want to share them with the masses. So ash gourd, winter melon, the cool vegetable. It's supposed to cool your body when it's hot out. So this is a great global warming vegetable if they ever needed one. But I don't hear any global warmest talking about this. And let's just read a little bit about the Indian tradition. They have told you this is a very auspicious vegetable. If you build a new house, you hang it in front of your house. If you want to do any ceremony, it comes into your house. Traditionally, it was fixed up like that, this. That even if you happen to grow an ash gourd in your own house, you should not eat it. You must give it away as a dana to Abrahim. It's supposed to contain prana. Oh, it's just amazing. I want, to get, I want someone to give me one of these melons so I can eat it. Hope you got something out of the video. We went over. But that's because we love you so much. We're not monitoring the most dangerous volcanoes on Earth. What we are doing is throwing millions of dollars on axial seamounts, which pose no threat to humans. 
We're throwing billions of dollars into large colliders, which have produced zero, zero scientific information for the benefit of anyone. Those billions of dollars wasted on those colliders and the nonsense of dark energy, dark matter, and black holes could have fed every hungry person on the planet, could also have planted billions of trees. If you think that the people you vote for care about you or they're actually doing anything for your benefit, you've taken the wrong pill. Share this with like-minded people. Be safe. We love you.